Chapter Sixteen of the Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. Chapter Sixteen: A Killing Frost. Fortunately for Ventimore, the momentary dismay he had felt on finding himself deserted by his unfathomable Jinny at the very outset of the ceremony passed unnoticed, as the prime warden of the candlestick maker's company immediately came to his rescue by briefly introducing him to the Lord Mayor, who with dignified courtesy had descended to the lowest step of the dais to receive him. Mr. Ventimore, said the chief magistrate cordially, as he pressed Horace's hand, you must allow me to say that I consider this one of the greatest privileges, if not the greatest privilege, that have fallen to my lot during a term of office in which I have had the honour of welcoming more than the usual number of illustrious visitors. My Lord Mayor, said Horace, with absolute sincerity, you really overwhelm me. I, I only wish I could feel that I had done anything to deserve this, this magnificent compliment. Ah! replied the Lord Mayor, in a paternally rallying tone. Modest, my dear sir, I perceive, like all truly great men, a most admirable trait. Permit me to present you to the sheriffs. The sheriffs appeared highly delighted. Horace shook hands with both of them. Indeed, in the flurry of the moment, he verily nearly offered to do so with the sword and mace-bearers as well. But their hands were, as it happened, otherwise engaged. The actual presentation, said the Lord Mayor, takes place in the great hall, as you are doubtless aware. "'I—I I have been given to understand so,' said Horace, with a sinking heart, for he had begun to hope that the worst was over. "'But before we adjourn,' said his host, "'you will let me tempt you to partake of some slight refreshment, uh, just a snack.' Horace was not hungry, but it occurred to him that he might get through the ceremony with more credit after a glass of champagne, so he accepted the invitation and was conducted to an extemporized buffet at one end of the library, where he fortified himself for the impending ordeal with a caviar sandwich and a bumper of the driest champagne in the corporation cellars. "'They talk of abolishing us,' said the Lord Mayor, as he took an anchovy on toast. "'But I maintain, Mr. Ventimore, I maintain that we, with our ancient customs, our time-honoured traditions, form a link with the past, which a wise statement will preserve, if I may employ a somewhat vulgar term, untinkered with. Horace agreed, remembering a link with a far more ancient past with which he devoutly wished he had refrained from tinkering. Talking of ancient customs, the Lord Mayor continued, with an odd blend of pride and apology, you will shortly have an illustration of our antiquated procedure which may impress you as quaint. Horace, feeling absolutely idiotic, murmured that he felt sure it would do that. "'Before presenting you for the freedom, the Prime Warden and the five officials of the Candlestick Maker's Company will give their testimony as compurgators in your favour, making oath that you are a man of good name and fame, and that—you will be amused at this, Mr. Ventimore—that you do desire the freedom of this city, whereby to defraud the Queen or the city. Ha! <laughs> ha! Curious way of putting it, is it not?' A "'Very.' said Horace, guiltily, and not a little concerned on the official's account. "'A mere form,' said the Lord Mayor. "'But I, for one, Mr. Ventimore, I, for one, should be sorry to see the picturesque old practices die out. To my mind,' he added, as he finished a pâté de foie gras sandwich, "'the modern impatience to sweep away all the ancient landmarks, whether they be superannuated or not, is one of the most disquieting symptoms of the age. You won't have any more champagne?' then I think we had better be making our way to the great hall for the event of the day. "'I'm afraid,' said Horace, with a sudden consciousness of his incongruously oriental attire, "'I'm afraid this is not quite the sort of dress for such a ceremony. If I had known—' "'Now don't say another word,' said the Lord Mayor. "'Your costume is very nice, very nice indeed, and, and most appropriate, I am sure. But I see the city marshal is waiting for us to head the procession. Shall we lead the way?' The band struck up the march of the priests from Atelier, and Horace, his head in a whirl, walked with his host, followed by the city lands committee, the sheriffs, and other dignitaries, through the art gallery and into the great hall, where their entrance was heralded by a flourish of trumpets. 
The hall was crowded, and Ventimore found himself the object of a popular demonstration which would have filled him with joy and pride if he could only have felt that he had done anything whatever to justify it, for it was ridiculous to suppose that he had rendered himself a public benefactor by restoring a convicted Jinny to freedom and society generally. His only consolation was that the English are a race not given to effusiveness without very good reason, and that before the ceremony was over he would be enabled to gather what were the particular services which had excited such unbounded enthusiasm. Meanwhile he stood there on the crimson-draped and flower-bedecked dais, bowing repeatedly and trusting that he did not look so forlornly foolish as he felt. A long shaft of sunlight struck down between the Gothic rafters and dappled the brown stone walls with patches of gold. The electric lights in the big hooped chandeliers showed pale and feeble against the subdued glow of the stained glass. The air was heavy with the scent of flowers and essences. Then there was a rustle of expectation in the audience, and a pause in which it seemed to Horace that everybody on the dais was almost as nervous and at a loss what to do next as he was himself. He wished with all his soul that they would hurry the ceremony through anyhow and let him go. At length, the proceedings began by a sort of solemn affectation of having merely met there for the ordinary business of the day, which to Horace just then seemed childish in the extreme. It was resolved that items one to four on the agenda need not be discussed, which brought them to item five. Item five was a resolution, read by the town clerk, that the freedom of the city should be presented to Horace Ventimore, Esquire, citizen and candlestick-maker, which last Horace was not aware of being but supposed vaguely that it had been somehow managed while he was at the buffet in the library. In recognition of his services, the resolution ran, and Horace listened with all his ears, especially in connection with— It was most unfortunate, but at this precise point the official was seized with an attack of coughing, in which all was lost but the conclusion of the sentence, that have justly entitled him to the gratitude and admiration of his fellow countrymen. Then— the six compurgators came forward and vouched for Ventimore's fitness to receive the freedom. He had painful doubts whether they altogether understood what a responsibility they were undertaking, but it was too late to warn them, and he could only trust that they knew more of their business than he did. After this the city chamberlain read him an address, to which Horace listened in resigned bewilderment. The chamberlain referred to the unanimity and enthusiasm with which the resolution had been carried, and said that it was his pleasing and honourable duty as the mouthpiece of that ancient city to address what he described with some inadequacy as a few words, to one by adding whose name to their role of freemen the corporation honoured rather themselves than the recipient of their homage. It was flattering, but to Horace's ear the phrases sounded excessive, almost fulsome though of course that depended very much on what he had done, which he had still to ascertain. The orator proceeded to read him the illustrious list of London's roll of fame, a recital which made Horace shiver with apprehension. For what names they were! What glorious deeds they had performed! How was it possible that he, plain Horace Ventimore, a struggling architect who had missed his one great chance, could have achieved, especially without even being aware of it, anything that would not seem ludicrously insignificant by comparison. He had a morbid fancy that the marble goddesses, or whoever they were, at the base of Nelson's monument opposite, were regarding him with stony disdain and indignation, that the statue of Wellington knew him for an errant impostor, and averted his head with cold contempt, and that the effigy of Lord Mayor Beckford on the right of the dais would come to life and denounce him in another moment. Turning now to your own distinguished services, he suddenly heard the city chamberlain resuming, you are probably aware, sir, that it is customary on these occasions to mention specifically the particular merit which had been deemed worthy of civic recognition. Horace was greatly relieved to hear it, for it struck him as a most sensible, and in his own particular case, essential, formality. But on the present occasion, sir, proceeded the speaker, I feel, as all present must feel, that it would be unnecessary— Nay, almost impertinent, were I to weary the public ear by a halting recapitulation of deeds with which it is already so appreciatively familiar. At this he was interrupted by deafening and long-continued applause, at the end of which he continued, I have only, therefore, to greet you in the name of the corporation, and to offer you the right hand of fellowship, as a freeman, and citizen, and candlestick-maker of London. As he shook hands, he presented Horace with a copy of the Oath of Allegiance, intimating that he was to read it aloud. 
Naturally, Ventimore had not the least objection to swear to be good and true to our sovereign lady, Queen of Victoria, or to be obedient to the Lord Mayor, and warn him of any conspiracies against the Queen's peace, which might chance to come under his observation. So he took the oath cheerfully enough, and hoped that this was really the end of the ceremony. However, to his great chagrin and apprehension, the Lord Mayor rose with the evident intention of making a speech. He said that the conclusion of the city to bestow the highest honour in their gift upon Mr. Horace Ventimore had been—here he hesitated—somewhat hastily arrived at. Personally, he would have liked a longer time to prepare, to make the display less inadequate to and worthier of this exceptional occasion. He thought that was the general feeling. It evidently was, judging from the loud and unanimous cheering. However, for reasons which— for reasons with which they were as well acquainted as himself, the notice had been short. The corporation had yielded, as they always had, as it would always be their pride and pleasure to yield, to popular pressure which was practically irresistible, and had done the best they could in the limited, he might almost say the unprecedentedly limited, period allowed them. The proudest leaf in Mr. Ventimore's chaplet of laurels to-day was, he would venture to assert, the sight of the extraordinary enthusiasm and assemblage, not only in that noble hall, but in the thoroughfares of this mighty metropolis. Under the circumstances this was a marvellous tribute to the admiration and affection which Mr. Ventimore had succeeded in inspiring in the great heart of the people, rich and poor, high and low. He would not detain his hearers any longer. All that remained for him to do was to ask Mr. Ventimore's acceptance of a golden casket containing the roll of freedom, and he felt sure that their distinguished guest, before proceeding to inscribe his name on the register, would oblige them all by some account from his own lips of, of the events in which he had figured so prominently and so creditably. Horace received the casket mechanically. There was a universal cry of, Speech! from the audience to which he replied by shaking his head in helpless deprecation. But in vain. He found himself irresistibly pressed towards the rail in front of the dais, and the roar of applause which greeted him saved him from all necessity of attempting to speak for nearly two minutes. During that interval he had time to clear his brain and think what he had better do or say in his present unenviable dilemma. For some time past a suspicion had been growing in his mind, until it had now almost swollen into certainty. He felt that before he compromised himself or allowed his two generous entertainers to compromise themselves irretrievably, it was absolutely necessary to ascertain his real position, and to do that he must make some sort of speech. With this resolve all his nervousness and embarrassment and indecision melted away. He faced the assembly coolly and gallantly, convinced that his best alternative now lay in perfect candour. My Lord Mayor, my lords, ladies, and gentlemen, he began, in a clear voice which penetrated to the farthest gallery, and commanded instant attention. If you expect to hear from me any description of what I've done to be received like this, I'm afraid you will be disappointed, for my own belief is that I've done nothing whatever. There was a general outcry of, No! No! at this, and a fervid murmur of protest. It's all very well to say no, no, said Horace, and I am extremely grateful to you all for the interruption. Still, I can only repeat that I am absolutely unaware of having ever rendered my country or this great city a single service deserving of the slightest acknowledgment. I wish I could feel I had, but the truth is that, if I have, the fact has entirely slipped from my memory." Again there were murmurs, this time with a certain undercurrent of irritation, and he could hear the Lord Mayor behind him remarking to the City Chamberlain that this was not at all the kind of speech for the occasion. I know what you're thinking, said Horace. You're thinking this is mock modesty on my part, but it's nothing of the sort. I don't know what I've done, but I presume you're all better informed. Because the corporation wouldn't have given me that very charming casket, you wouldn't all be here like this unless you were under a strong impression that I'd done something to deserve it. At this there was a fresh outburst of applause. Just so, said Horace calmly. Well, now, will any of you be kind enough to tell me in a few words— what do you suppose I've done?" There was a dead silence, in which everyone looked at his or her neighbour and smiled feebly. "'My Lord Mayor,' continued Horace, "'I appeal to you to tell me and this distinguished assembly why on earth we're all here.' The Lord Mayor rose. "'I think it is sufficient to say,' he announced with dignity, 
that the corporation and myself were unanimously of opinion that this distinction should be awarded for reasons which it is unnecessary and um uh, invidious to enter into here i'm sorry persisted horace but i must press your lordship for those reasons i have an object will the city chamberlain oblige me then no well then the town clerk no it's just as i suspected none of you can give me your reasons and shall i tell you why because there aren't any now do bear with me for a moment i'm quite aware this is very embarrassing for all of you but remember that it's infinitely more awkward for me i really cannot accept the freedom of the city under any suspicion of false pretenses it would be a poor reward for your hospitality and base and unpatriotic into the bargain to depreciate the value of so great a distinction by permitting it to be conferred unworthily if after you've heard what i'm going to tell you you still insist on my accepting such an honour of course i will not be so ungracious as to refuse it but i really don't feel that it would be right to inscribe my name on your roll of fame without some sort of explanation if i did i might for anything i know involuntarily be signing the death warrant of the corporation there was a breathless hush upon this the silence grew so intense that to borrow a slightly involved metaphor from a distinguished friend of the writers you might have picked up a pin in it horace leaned sideways against the rail in an easy attitude so as to face the lord mayor as well as a portion of his audience before i go any farther he said will your lordship pardon me if i suggest that it might be as well to direct that all reporters present should immediately withdraw the reporter's table was instantly in a stir of anger and many of the guests expressed some dissatisfaction we at least said the lord mayor rising flushed with annoyance have no reason to dread publicity i decline to make a whole and corner affair of this i shall give no such orders very well said horace when the chorus of approval had subsided uh, my suggestion was made quite as much in the corporation's interests as mine i merely thought that when you all clearly understood how grossly you've been deluded you might prefer to have the details kept out of the newspapers if possible but if you particularly want them published over the whole world why of course an uproar followed here under cover of which the lord mayor contrived to give orders to have the doors fastened till further directions don't make this more difficult and disagreeable for me than it already is said horace as soon as he could obtain a hearing again you don't suppose that i should have come here in this tom fool's dress imposing myself on the hospitality of this great city if i could have helped it if you've been brought here under false pretenses so have i if you've been made to look rather foolish what is your situation to mine the fact is i am the victim of a headstrong force which i am utterly unable to control upon this a fresh uproar arose and prevented him from continuing for some time i only ask for fair play and a patient hearing he pleaded give me that and i will undertake to restore you all to good humour before i have done they calmed down at this appeal and he was able to proceed my case is simply this he said a little time ago i happened to go to an auction and buy a large brass bottle for some inexplicable reason his last words roused the audience to absolute frenzy they would not hear anything about the brass bottle every time he attempted to mention it they howled him down they hissed they groaned they shook their fists the din was positively deafening nor was the demonstration confined to the male portion of the assembly one lady indeed who was a prominent leader in society but whose name shall not be divulged here was so carried away by her feelings as to hurl a heavy cut-glass bottle of smelling salts at horace's offending head fortunately for him it missed him and only caught one of the officials horace was not in a mood to notice details very accurately but he had a notion that it was the city remembrancer somewhere about the region of the watch pocket will you hear me out ventimore shouted i'm not trifling i haven't told you yet what was inside the bottle when i opened it i found he got no farther for as the words left his lips he felt himself seized by the collar of his robe and lifted off his feet by an agency he was powerless to resist up and up he was carried past the great chandeliers between the carved and gilded rafters pursued by a universal shriek of dismay and horror down below he could see the throng of pale upturned faces and hear the wild screams and laughter of several ladies of great distinction in violent hysterics and the next moment he was in the glass lantern and the latticed panes gave way like tissue paper as he broke through into the open air causing the pigeons on the roof to whir up in a flutter of alarm 
Of course he knew that it was the jinnee who was abducting him in this sensational manner, and he was rather relieved than alarmed by Fakrash's summary proceeding, for he seemed, for once, to have hit upon the best way out of a situation that was rapidly becoming impossible. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey Chapter 17 High Words Once outside in the open air, the jinnee towered like a pheasant shot through the breast, and Horace closed his eyes with a combined swing, switchback, and channel passage sensation during a flight which apparently continued for hours, although in reality it probably did not occupy more than a very few seconds. His uneasiness was still further increased by his inability to guess where he was being taken to, for he felt instinctively that they were not travelling in the direction of home. At last he felt himself set down on some hard, firm surface, and ventured to open his eyes once more. When he realized where he actually was, his knees gave way under him, and he was seized with a sudden giddiness that very nearly made him lose his balance, for he found himself standing on a sort of narrow ledge or cornice immediately under the ball at the top of St. Paul's. Many feet beneath him spread the dull, leaden summit of the dome, its raised ridges stretching like huge serpents over the curve, beyond which was a glimpse of the green roof of the nave and the two west towers, with their grey columns and urn-topped buttresses and gilded pineapples, which shone ruddily in the sun. He had an impression of Ludgate Hill and Fleet Street as a deep, winding ravine, steeped in partial shadow, of long sierras of roofs and chimney-pots showing their sharp outlines above mouse-coloured smoke-wreaths, of the broad, pearl-tinted river with oily ripples and a golden glitter where the sunlight touched it, of the gleaming slope of mud under the wharves and warehouses on the Surrey side, of barges and steamers moored in black clusters, of a small tug fussing noisily down the river, leaving a broadening arrowhead in its wake. Cautiously he moved round towards the east, where the houses formed a blurred mosaic of cream, slate, indigo, and dull reds and browns, above which slender rose-flushed spires and towers pierced the haze, stained in countless places by pillars of black, grey, and amber smoke, and lightened by plumes and jets of silvery steam, till all blended by imperceptible gradations into a sky of tenderest gold slashed with translucent blue. It was a magnificent view, and none the less so because the indistinctness of all beyond a limited radius made the huge city seem not only mystical, but absolutely boundless in extent. But although Ventimore was distinctly conscious of all this, he was scarcely in a state to appreciate its grandeur just then. He was much too concerned with wondering why Fakrash had chosen to plant him up there in so insecure a position, and how he was ever to be rescued from it, since the jinnee had apparently disappeared. He was not far off, however, for presently, Horace saw him stalk round the narrow cornice with an air of being perfectly at home on it. "'So there you are,' said Ventimore. "'I thought you'd deserted me again. What have you brought me up here for?' "'Because I desired to have speech with thee in private,' replied the jinnee. "'We're not likely to be intruded on here, certainly,' said Horace. "'But isn't it rather exposed, rather public? If we're seen up here, you know, it will cause a decided sensation.' I have laid a spell on all below that they should not raise their eyes. Be seated, therefore, and hear my words. Horace lowered himself carefully to a sitting position, so that his legs dangled in space, and Fakrash took a seat by his side. O oh, most indiscreet of mankind, he began, in an aggrieved tone, thou hast been near the committal of a great blunder, and doing ill to thyself and to me. Well, "'I do like that,' retorted Harris, "'when you let me in for all that freedom of the city business "'and then sneaked off, leaving me to get out of it the best way I could, "'and only come back just as I was about to explain matters "'and carried me up through the roof like a sack of flour. "'Do you consider that tactful on your part? "'Thou hadst drunk wine and permitted it to creep as far as the place of secrets. 
"'Only one glass,' said Horace, "'and I wanted it, I can assure you. I was obliged to make a speech to them, and thanks to you I was in such a hole that I saw nothing for it but to tell the truth.' "'Veracity, as thou wilt learn,' answered the jinnee, "'is not invariably the ship of safety. Thou wert about to betray the benefactor who procured for thee such glory and honour as might well cause the gall-bladder of lions to burst with envy.' "'If any lion with the least sense of humour could have witnessed the proceedings,' said Ventimore, "'he might have burst with laughter, certainly not envy. "'Good Lord, Fakrash!' he cried, in his indignation, "'I've never felt such an absolute ass in my whole life. "'If nothing would satisfy you but my receiving the freedom of the city, "'you might at least have contrived some decent excuse for it, "'but you left out the only point there was in the whole thing, and all for what?' "'What doth it signify why the whole populace should come forth to acclaim thee and do thee honour, so long as they did so?' said Fakrash sullenly. "'For the report of thy fame would reach Bedea el Jemal.' "'That's just where you're mistaken,' said Horace. "'If you had not been in too desperate a hurry to make a few inquiries, you would have found out that you were taking all this trouble for nothing.' "'How sayest thou?' "'Well, you would have discovered that the princess is spared all temptation to marry beneath her by the fact that she became the bride of somebody else about thirty centuries ago. She married a mortal, one Saif el Muluk, a king's son, and they've both been dead a considerable time. Another obstacle to your plans. It is a lie, declared Fakrash. If you will take me back to Vincent Square, I shall be happy to show you the evidence in your national records, said Horace and you may be glad to know that your old enemy, Mr. Jarjaris, came to a violent end after a very sporting encounter with a king's daughter, who, though proficient in advanced magic, unfortunately perished herself, poor lady, in the final round. "'I had intended thee to accomplish his downfall,' said Fakrash. "'I know,' said Horace. "'It was most thoughtful of you, but I doubt if I should have done it half as well, and it would have probably cost me an eye at the very least. It's better as it is.' "'And how long hast thou known of these things?' "'Only since last night.' "'Since last night? And thou didst not unfold them unto me till this instant?' "'I've had such a busy morning, you see,' explained Horace. "'There's been no time.' "'Silly bearded fool that I was to bring this misbegotten dog into the august presence of the great Lord Mayor himself, on whom be peace,' cried the jinnee. I object to being referred to as a misbegotten dog, said Horace, but with the rest of your remark I entirely concur. I'm afraid the Lord Mayor is very far from being at peace just now. He pointed to the steep roof of the guild hall with its dormers and fretted pinnacles, and the slender lantern through which he had so lately made his inglorious exit. There's the devil of a row going on under that lantern just now, Mr. Fakrash, you may depend on that. They've locked the doors so they can decide what to do next, which will take them some time. And it's all your fault. It was thy doing. Why didst thou dare to inform the Lord Mayor that he was deceived? Why? Because I thought he ought to know. Because I was bound, particularly after my oath of allegiance, to warn him of any conspiracy against him. Because I was in such a hat. He'll understand all that. He won't blame me for this business. It is fortunate, observed the jinnee, that I flew away with thee before thou couldst pronounce my name. You gave yourself away, said Horace. They all saw you, you know. You weren't flying so particularly fast. They'll recognize you again. If you will carry off a man from under the Lord Mayor's very nose, and shoot up through the roof like a rocket with him, you can't expect to escape some notice. You see, you happen to be the only unbottled jinny in this city." Fakrash shifted his seat on the cornice. "'I have committed no act of disrespect unto the Lord Mayor,' he said. Therefore he can have no just cause of anger against me. Horace perceived that the jinnee was not altogether at ease, and pushed his advantage accordingly. "'My dear good old friend,' he said, "'you don't seem to realize yet what an awful thing you've done. For your own mistaken purposes you have compelled the chief magistrate and the corporation of the greatest city in the world to make themselves hopelessly ridiculous. They'll never hear the last of this affair. Just look at the crowds waiting patiently below there. Look at the flags. Think of that gorgeous conveyance of yours standing outside the guild hall. Think of the assembly inside. All the most aristocratic, noble, and distinguished personages in the land, continued Horace, piling it on as he proceeded. All collected for what? To be made fools of by a jinnee out of a brass bottle. For their own sakes they will preserve silence, said Fakrash, with a gleam of unwanted shrewdness. Probably they would hush it up if they only could, conceded Horace. But how can they? What are they to say? What plausible explanation can they give? 
Besides, there's the press. You don't know what the press is, but I assure you its power is tremendous. It's simply impossible to keep anything secret from it nowadays. It has eyes and ears everywhere, and a thousand tongues. Five minutes after the doors in that hall are unlocked, and they can't keep them locked much longer, the reporters will be handing in their special descriptions of you and your latest vagaries to their respective journals. Within half an hour bills will be carried through every quarter of London, bills with enormous letters, extraordinary scene at the Guildhall. Strange end to a civic function. Startling appearance of an oriental genie in the city. Abduction of a guest of the Lord Mayor. Intense excitement. Full particulars. And by that time the story will have flashed around the whole world. Keep silence, indeed. Do you imagine for a moment that the Lord Mayor or anybody else concerned, however remotely, will ever forget or be allowed to forget such an outrageous incident as this? If you do, believe me, you're mistaken. Truly, it would be a terrible thing to incur the wrath of the Lord Mayor, said the Jinny, in troubled accents. Awful, said Horace, but you seem to have managed it. He weareth round his neck a magic jewel, which giveth him dominion over devils. Is it not so? You know best, said Horace. It was the splendor of that jewel and the majesty of his countenance that rendered me afraid to enter his presence, lest he should recognize me for what I am, and command me to obey him, for verily his might is greater even than Suleiman's, and his hand heavier upon such of the jinn as fall into his power. If that's so, said Horace, I should strongly advise you to find some way of putting things straight before it's too late. You've no time to lose. Thou sayest well, said Fakrash, springing to his feet and turning his face toward Cheapside. Horace shuffled himself along the ledge in a seated position after the jinny, and looking down between his feet could just see the tops of the thin and rusty trees in the churchyard, the black and serried swarms of foreshortened people in the street, and the scarlet-rimmed mouths of chimney-pots on the tiled roofs below. "'There is but one remedy I know,' said the jinny, "'and it may be that I have lost power to perform it. Yet will I make the endeavor." and stretching forth his right hand towards the east, he muttered some kind of command or invocation. Horace almost fell off the cornice with apprehension of what might follow. Would it be a thunderbolt, a plague, some frightful convulsion of nature? He felt sure that Fakrash would hesitate at no means, however violent, of burying all traces of his blunder in oblivion, and very little hope that whatever he did, it would prove anything but some worse indiscretion than his previous performances. Happily, None of these extreme measures seemed to have occurred to the jinnee, though what followed was strange and striking enough. For presently, as if in obedience to the jinnee's weird gesticulations, a lurid belt of fog came rolling up from the direction of the Royal Exchange, swallowing up building after building in its rapid course, one by one, the Guildhall, Bow Church, Cheapside itself, and the churchyard disappeared, and Horace, turning his head to the left, saw the murky tide sweeping on westward, blotting out Ludgate Hill, the Strand, Charing Cross, and Westminster, till at last he and Fakrash were alone above a limitless plain of bituminous cloud, the only living beings left, as it seemed, in a blank and silent universe. "'Look again,' said Fakrash, and Horace, looking eastward, saw the spire of Bow Church, rosy once more, the Guildhall standing clear and intact, and the streets and housetops gradually reappearing. Only the flags, with their unrestful shiver and ripple of colour, had disappeared, and with them the waiting crowds and the mounted constables. The ordinary traffic of vans, omnibuses, and cabs was proceeding as though it had never been interrupted. The clank and jingle of harness chains, the cries and whip-crackings of drivers, rose with curious distinctness above the incessant trampling roar which is the ground-swell of the human ocean. "'That cloud which thou sawest,' said Fakrash, "'hath swept away with it all memory of this affair "'from the minds of every mortal assembled to do thee honour. "'See, they go about their several businesses, "'and all the past incidents are to them as though they had never been.' "'It was not often that Horace could honestly commend "'any performance of the jinnies, "'but at this he could not restrain his admiration. "'By Jove!' he said, "'that certainly gets the Lord Mayor and everybody else "'out of the mess as neatly as possible.' I must say, Mr. Fakrash, it's much the best thing I've seen you do yet. Wait, said the jinnee, for presently thou shalt see me perform a yet more excellent thing. There was a most unpleasant green glow in his eyes, and a bristle in his thin beard as he spoke, which suddenly made Horace feel uncomfortable. 
He did not like the look of the genie at all. "'I really think you've done enough for today,' he said, "'and this wind up here is rather searching. I shan't be sorry to find myself on the ground again.' "'That,' replied the genie, "'thou shalt assuredly do before long, O impudent and deceitful wretch.' And he laid a long, lean hand on Horace's shoulder. "'He is put out about something,' thought Ventimore. "'But what?' "'My dear sir,' he said aloud, "'I don't understand this tone of yours. "'What have I done to offend you?' "'Divinely gifted was he who said, "'Beware of losing hearts in consequence of injury, "'for the bringing them back after flight is difficult.' "'Excellent,' said Horace, "'but I don't quite see the application.' "'The application,' explained the jinnee, "'is that I am determined to cast thee down from here with my own hand.' "'Horace turned faint and dizzy for a moment.' Then, by a strong effort of will, he pulled himself together. "'Oh, come now,' he said. "'You don't really mean that, you know. After all your kindness, you're much too good-natured to be capable of anything so atrocious.' "'All pity hath been eradicated from my heart,' returned Fakrash. "'Therefore, prepare to die, for thou art presently about to perish in the most unfortunate manner.' Ventimore could not repress a shudder. Hitherto he had never been able to take Fakrash quite seriously, in spite of all his supernatural powers. He had treated him with a half-kindly, half-contemptuous tolerance, as a well-meaning but hopelessly incompetent old foozle. That the jinnee should ever become malevolent towards him had never entered his head till now, and yet he undoubtedly had. How was he to cajole and disarm this formidable being? He must keep cool and act promptly, or he would never see Sylvia again. As he sat there on the narrow ledge with a faint and not unpleasant smell of hops saluting his nostrils from some distant brewery, he tried hard to collect his thoughts, but could not. He found himself instead idly watching the busy, jostling crowd below, who were all unconscious of the impending drama so high above them. Just over the rim of the dome he could see the opaque white top of a lamp on a shelter, where a pygmy constable stood, directing the traffic. Would he look up if Horace called for help? Even if he could, what help could he render? All he could do would be to keep the crowd back and send for a covered stretcher. No, he would not dwell on these horrors. He must fix his mind on some way of circumventing Fakrash. How did the people in the Arabian Nights manage? The fisherman, for instance. He persuaded his jinnee to return to the bottle by pretending to doubt whether he had ever really been inside it. But Fakrash, though simple enough in some respects, was not quite such a fool as that. Sometimes the jinn could be mollified and induced to grant a reprieve by being told stories, one inside the other, like a nest of oriental boxes. Unfortunately, Fakrash did not seem in the humour for listening to apologues, and even if he were, Horace could not think of or improvise any just then. Besides, he thought, I can't sit up here telling him anecdotes for ever. I'd almost sooner die. Still, he remembered that it was generally possible to draw an Arabian Efreet into discussion. They all loved argument, and had a rough conception of justice. "'I think, Mr. Fakrash,' he said, "'that in common fairness I have a right to know what offence I have committed.' "'To recite thy misdeeds,' replied the jinnee, "'would occupy much time.' "'I don't mind that,' said Horace, affably. "'I can give you as long as you like. I'm in no sort of a hurry.' "'With me it is otherwise,' retorted Fakrash, making a stride towards him. Therefore court not life, for thy death hath become unavoidable. Before we part, said Horace, you won't refuse to answer one or two questions. Didst thou not undertake never to ask any further favour of me? Moreover, it will avail thee not, for I am positively determined to slay thee. I demand it, said Horace, in the most great name of the Lord Mayor, on whom be peace. It was a desperate shot, but it took effect. The jinny quailed visibly. Ask, then he said, but briefly, for the time groweth short. Horace, determined to make one last appeal to Fakrash's sense of gratitude, since it had always seemed the dominant trait in his character. Well, he said, but for me, wouldn't you still be in that brass bottle? That, replied the jinnee, is the very reason why I propose to destroy thee. Oh, was all Horace could find to say at this most unlooked-for answer. His sheet-anchor, in which he had trusted implicitly, had suddenly dragged, and he was drifting fast to destruction. "'Are there any other questions which thou wouldst ask?' 
inquired the jinnee with grim indulgence, or wilt thou encounter thy doom without further procrastination? Horace was determined not to give in just yet. He had a very bad hand, but he might as well play the game out, and trust to luck to gain a stray trick. "'I haven't nearly done yet,' he said, "'and remember, you've promised to answer me in the name of the Lord Mayor.' "'I will answer one other question and no more,' said the jinnee, in an inflexible tone, and Ventimore realized that his fate would depend upon what he said next. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. Chapter 18 A Game of Bluff. Thy second question, O pertinacious one, said the genie impatiently. He was standing with folded arms looking down on Horace, who was still seated on the narrow cornice, not daring to glance below again, lest he should lose his head altogether. "'I'm coming to it,' said Ventimore. "'I want to know why you should propose to dash me to pieces in this barbarous way as a return for letting you out of that bottle. Were you so comfortable in it as all that?' In the bottle I was at least suffered to rest, and none molested me. But in releasing me, thou didst perfidiously conceal from me that Suleiman was dead and gone, and that there reigneth one in his stead mightier a thousandfold, who afflicteth our race with labours and tortures exceeding all the punishments of Suleiman. "'What on earth have you got in your head now? You can't mean the Lord Mayor?' "'Whom else?' said the genie solemnly, and though for this once by a device I have evaded his vengeance, yet do I know full well that either by virtue of the magic jewel upon his breast, or through that malignant monster with the myriad ears and eyes and tongues, which thou callest the press, I shall inevitably fall into his power before long. For the life of him, in spite of his desperate plight, Horace could not help laughing. "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Fakrash,' he said, as soon as he could speak, "'but the Lord Mayor! It's really too absurd. Why, he wouldn't hurt a hair on a fly's head!' "'Seek not to deceive me further,' said Fakrash furiously. "'Didst thou not inform me with thy own mouth that the spirits of earth, air, water, and fire were subject to his will?' Have I no eyes? Do I not behold from here the labours of my captive brethren? What are those on yonder bridges but enslaved gin, shrieking and groaning in clanking fetters, and snorting forth steam, as they drag their wheeled burdens behind them? Are there not others toiling with panting efforts through the sluggish waters, others again imprisoned in lofty pillars, from which the smoke of their breath ascendeth even unto heaven? Doth not the air throb and quiver with their restless struggles as they writhe below in darkness and torment? And thou hast the shamelessness to pretend that these things are done in the Lord Mayor's own realms without his knowledge. Verily thou must take me for a fool. After all, reflected Ventimore, if he chooses to consider that railway engines and steamers and machinery generally are inhabited by so many jinn doing time, it's not to my interest to undeceive him. Indeed, it's quite the contrary. I wasn't aware the Lord Mayor had so much power as all that, he said, but very likely you're right. And if you're so anxious to keep in favour with him, it would be a great mistake to kill me. That would annoy him. Not so, said the genie, for I should declare that thou hadst spoken slightingly of him in my hearing, and that I had slain thee on that account. Your proper course, said Horace, would be to hand me over to him and let him deal with the case, much more regular. That may be, said Fakrash, but I have conceived so bitter a hatred to thee by reason of thy insolence and treachery that I cannot forego the delight of slaying thee with my own hand. "'Can't you really?' 
said Horace, on the verge of despair. And then what will you do? Then, replied the genie, I shall flee away to Arabia, where I shall be safe. <laughs> Don't be too sure of that, said Horace. You see all those wires stretched on poles down there? Those are the pathways of certain gin known as electric currents, and the Lord Mayor could send a message along them which would be at Baghdad before you had flown farther than Folkestone. And I may mention that Arabia is now more or less under British jurisdiction. He was bluffing, of course, for he knew perfectly well that, even if any extradition treaty could be put in force, the arrest of a genie would be no easy matter. "'Thou art of opinion, then, that I would be no safer in mine own country?' inquired Fakrash. "'I swear by the name of the Lord Mayor, to whom be all reverence,' said Horace, "'that there is no land you could fly to where you would be any safer than you are here.' "'If I were but sealed up in my bottle once more,' said the genie, "'would not even the Lord Mayor have respect unto the seal of Suleiman?' and forbear to disturb me? Why, of course he would, cried Horace, hardly daring to believe his ears. That's really a brilliant idea of yours, my dear Mr. Fakrash. And in the bottle I should not be compelled to work, continued the genie, for labor of all kinds hath ever been abhorrent unto me. I can quite understand that, said Horace sympathetically, just imagine your having to drag an excursion train to the seaside on a bank holiday, or being condemned to print off a cheap comic paper, or even the war cry, when you might be leading a snug and idle existence in your bottle. If I were you, I should go and get inside it at once. Suppose we go back to Vincent Square and find it. I shall return to the bottle, since in that alone there is safety, said the genie, but I shall return alone. Alone! cried Horace. You're not going to leave me stuck up here all by myself? By no means, said the genie. Have I not said that I am about to cast thee into perdition? Too long have I delayed in the accomplishment of this duty. Once more Horace gave himself up for lost, which was doubly bitter just when he had begun to consider that the danger was past but even then he was determined to fight to the last. "'One moment,' he said. "'Of course, if you've set your heart on pitching me over, you must. Only, I may be quite mistaken, but I don't quite see how you are going to manage the rest of your program without me, that's all.' "'Oh, deficient in intelligence!' cried the genie. "'What assistance canst thou render me?' "'Well,' said Horace, of course, you can get into the bottle alone, that's simple enough, but the difficulty I see is this. Are you quite sure you can put the cap on yourself, from the inside, you know? If he can, he thought, I'm done for. That, began the genie, with his usual confidence, will be the easiest of— Nay, he corrected himself, there be things that not even the jinn themselves can accomplish, and one of them is to seal a vessel while remaining in it. I am indebted to thee for reminding me thereof. Not at all, said Ventimore. I shall be delighted to come and seal you up comfortably myself. Again thou speakest folly, exclaimed the genie. How canst thou seal me up after I have dashed thee into a thousand pieces? That, said Horace, with all the urbanity he could command, is precisely the difficulty I was trying to convey. There will be no difficulty, for as soon as I am in the bottle I shall summon certain inferior ephrites, and they shall replace the seal. When you are once in the bottle, said Horace at a venture, you probably won't be in a position to summon anybody. "'Before I get into the bottle, then,' said the genie impatiently, "'thou dost but juggle with words.' "'But about those Ephrites,' persisted Horace, "'you know what Ephrites are. How can you be sure that, when they've got you in the bottle, they won't hand you over to the Lord Mayor? 
I shouldn't trust them myself, but of course you know best. Whom shall I trust, then? said Fakrash, frowning. I'm sure I don't know. It's rather a pity you're so determined to destroy me, because, as it happens, I'm just the one person living who could be depended on to seal you up and keep your secret. However, that's your affair. After all, why should I care what becomes of you? I shan't be there. Even at this hour, said the genie undecidedly, I might find it in my heart to spare thee, were I but sure that thou wouldst be faithful unto me. I should have thought I was more to be trusted than one of your beastly efreets, said Horace, with well-assumed indifference. But never mind, I don't know that I care, after all. I've nothing particular to live for now. You've ruined me pretty thoroughly, and you may as well finish your work. I've a good mind to jump over and save you the trouble. Perhaps, when you see me bouncing down that dome, you'll be sorry." "'Refrain from rashness,' said the genie hastily, without suspecting that Ventimore had no serious intention of carrying out his threat. "'If thou wilt do as thou art bidden, I will not only pardon thee, but grant thee all that thou desirest.' "'Take me back to Vincent Square first, said Horace. "'This is not the place to discuss business.' "'Thou sayest rightly,' replied the genie. "'Hold fast to my sleeve, and I will transport thee to thine abode.' "'Not till you promise to play fair,' said Horace, pausing on the brink of the ledge. "'Remember, if you let me go now, you drop the only friend you've got in the world.' "'May I be thy ransom,' replied Fakrash. "'There shall not be harmed a hair of thy head.' Even then Horace had his misgivings, but as there was no other way of getting off that cornice, he decided to take the risk. And, as it proved, he acted judiciously, for the genie flew to Vincent Square with honourable precision, and dropped him neatly into the armchair in which he had little hoped ever to find himself again. "'I have brought thee hither,' said Fakrash, and yet I am persuaded that thou art even now devising treachery against me, and wilt betray me if thou canst. Horace was about to assure him once more that no one could be more anxious than himself to see him safely back in his bottle, when he recollected that it was impolitic to appear too eager. "'After the way you've behaved,' he said, "'I'm not at all sure that I ought to help you.' Still I said I would, on certain conditions, and I'll keep my word. Conditions, thundered the genie, wilt thou bargain with me yet further? My excellent friend, said Horace quietly, you know perfectly well that you can't get yourself safely sealed up again in that bottle without my assistance. If you don't like my terms, and prefer to take your chance of finding an Efreet who is willing to brave the Lord Mayor, well, you've only to say so. I have loaded thee with all manner of riches and favours, and I will bestow no more upon thee, said the genie sullenly. Nay, in token of my displeasure, I will deprive thee even of such gifts as thou hast retained. He pointed his grey forefinger at Ventimore, whose turban and jewelled robes instantly shrivelled into cobwebs and tinder, and fluttered to the carpet in filmy shreds, leaving him in nothing but his underclothing. "'That only shows what a nasty temper you're in,' said Horace blandly, "'and doesn't annoy me in the least. If you'll excuse me, I'll go and put on some things I can feel more at home in, and perhaps by the time I return you'll have cooled down.' He slipped on some clothes hurriedly and re-entered the sitting-room. "'Now, Mr. Fakrash,' he said, "'we'll have this out.' you talk of having loaded me with benefits. You seem to consider I ought to be grateful to you. In heaven's name, for what? I've been as forbearing as possible all this time, because I gave you credit for meaning well. Now I'll speak plainly. I told you from the first, and I tell you now, that I want no riches nor honours from you. 
the one real good turn you did me was bringing me that client and you spoilt that because you would insist on building the palace yourself instead of leaving it to me as for the rest here am i a ruined and discredited man with a client who probably supposes i'm in league with the devil with the girl i love and might have married believing that i have left her to marry a princess and her father unable ever to forgive me for having seen him as a one-eyed mule in short i'm in such a mess all round that i don't care two straws whether i live or die what is all this to me said the genie only this that unless you can see your way to putting things straight for me i'm hanged if i take the trouble to seal you up in that bottle how am i to put things straight for thee cried fakrash peevishly if you could make all those people entirely forget that affair in the guild hall you can make my friends forget the brass bottle and everything connected with it can't you there would be no difficulty in that fakrash admitted well do it and i'll swear i'll seal you up in that bottle exactly as if you had never been out of it and pitch you into the deepest part of the thames where no one will ever disturb you first produce the bottle then said fakrash for i cannot believe that thou hast some lurking guile in thy heart i'll ring for my landlady and have the bottle brought up said horace perhaps that will satisfy you stay you'd better not let her see you i will render myself invisible said the genie suiting the action to his words but beware lest thou play me false his voice continued for i shall hear thee so you've come in mr ventimore said mrs rapkin as she entered and without the furrin gentleman i was surprised and so was rapkin the same to see you riding off this morning in the gorgeous chariot and osses and dressed up that lovely depend upon it i says to rapkin i says depend upon it mr ventimore'll be sent up for buckingham palace if it ain't windsor castle never mind that now said horace impatiently i want that brass bottle i bought the other day bring it up at once please i thought you said the other day you never wanted to set eyes on it again and i was to do as i pleased with it sir well i've changed my mind so let me have it quick i'm sure i'm very sorry sir but that you can't because rapkin not wishful to have the place lumbered up with rubbish disposed of it only last night to a gentleman as keeps a rag and bone emporium off the bridge road and half a crown was the most he'd give for it sir give me his name said horace dilger sir emmanuel dilger when rapkin comes in i'm sure he'd go round with pleasure and see about it if required i'll go around myself said horace it's all right mrs rapkin quite a natural mistake on your part but but i happen to want the bottle again you needn't stay oh thou smooth-faced and double-tongued one said the genie after she had gone as he reappeared to view did i not foresee that thou wouldst deal crookedly restore unto me my bottle i'll go and get it at once said horace i shan't be five minutes and he prepared to go thou shalt not leave this house cried fakrash for i perceive plainly that this is but a device of thine to escape and betray me to the press devil if you can't see said horace angrily that i'm quite as anxious to see you safely back in that confounded bottle as ever you can be to get there you must be pretty dense can't you understand the bottle's sold and i can't buy it back without going out don't be so infernally unreasonable go then said the genie and i will await thy return here but know this that if thou delayest long or returnest without my bottle i shall know that thou art a traitor and will visit thee and those who are dear to thee with the most unpleasant punishments i will be back in half an hour at most said horace 
feeling that this would allow him ample margin, and thankful that it did not occur to Fakrash to go in person. He put on his hat and hurried off in the gathering dusk. He had some little trouble in finding Mr. Dilger's establishment, which was a dirty, dusty little place in a back street, with a few deplorable old chairs, rickety washstands, and rusty fenders outside, and the interior almost completely blocked by piles of dingy mattresses, empty clock-cases, tarnished and cracked mirrors, broken lamps, damaged picture-frames, and everything else which one could imagine could have no possible value for any human being. But in all this collection of worthless curios the brass bottle was nowhere to be seen. Ventimore went in and found a youth of about thirteen straining his eyes in the fading light over one of those halfpenny humorous journals, which, thanks to an improved system of education, at least eighty per cent of our juvenile population are now enabled to appreciate. "'I want to see Mr. Dilger,' he began. "'You can't,' said the youth, "'cause he ain't in. He's attending of an auction.' when will he be in do you know might be back to his tea but i wasn't to expect him not before supper you don't happen to have any old metal bottles copper or or brass would you for sale you don't get at me like that bottles is made of glorse well a jar then a big brass pot anything of that kind don't keep em said the boy and buried himself once more in his copy of Spicy Sniggers. "'I'll just look around,' said Horace, and began to poke about with a sinking heart and a horrid dread that he might have come to the wrong shop, for the big pot-bellied vessel certainly did not seem to be there. At last, to his unspeakable joy, he discovered it under a piece of tattered drugget. "'Why, this is the sort of thing I meant,' he said, feeling in his pocket and discovering that he had exactly a sovereign. "'How much do you want for it?' "'I don't know,' said the boy. "'I don't mind three shillings,' said Horace, who did not wish to appear too keen at first. "'I'll tell the governor when he comes in,' was the reply, "'and you can look in later.' "'I want it at once,' insisted Horace. "'Come, I'll give you three and six for it.' "'It's more than it's worth,' replied the candid youth. "'Perhaps,' said Horace, "'but I'm rather pressed for time. "'If you'll change this sovereign, "'I'll take the bottle away with me.' "'You seem uncommon anxious to get old on it, mister,' "'said the boy with sudden suspicion. "'Nonsense,' said Horace. "'I live close by, and I thought I might as well take it, "'that's all.' "'Oh, if that's all, you can wait till the governor's in.' "'I—I I mayn't be passing this way again for some time,' said Horace. "'Bound to be if you live close by,' said the provoking youth, and the provoking youth returned to his sniggers. "'Do you call this attending to your master's business?' said Horace. "'Listen to me, you young rascal. I'll give you five shillings for it, you're not going to be fool enough to refuse an offer like that. I ain't going to be fool enough to refuse it, nor yet I ain't going to be fool enough to take it, cause I'm only ear to see as nobody don't come in and sneak things. I ain't got no authority to sell any fink, and I don't know the price of nothing, so there you have it. Take the five shillings, said Horace and if it's too little, I'll come round and settle with your master later. I thought you said you wasn't likely to be porcin again. No, mister, you don't kid me that way. Horace had a mad impulse to snatch up the precious bottle then and there and make off with it, and might have yielded to the temptation, with disastrous consequences, had not an elderly man entered the shop at that moment. He was bent, and wore rather more fluff and flue upon his person than most well-dressed people would consider necessary, but he came in with a certain air of authority nevertheless. "'Mr. Dilger, sir,' piped the youth, "'ere's a gent took a fancy to this ere brass pot of yours. Says he must have it. Five shillings he'd got to, but I told him he'd have to wait till you come in.' 
quite right my lad said mr dilger cocking a watery but sharp old eye at horace five shillings ah sir you can't know much about these hold brass antiques to make an orfer like that i know as much as most people said horace but let us say six shillings couldn't be done sir couldn't indeed why i give a pound for it myself at christie's as sure as i'm standin here in the presence of my maker and you a sinner he declared impressively if rather ambiguously your memory is not quite accurate said horace you bought it last night from a man of the name of rapkin who lets lodgings in vincent square and you paid exactly half a crown for it if you say so i dare say it's correct sir said mr dilger without exhibiting the least confusion and if i did buy it off mr rapkin he's a respectable party and ain't likely to come by it dishonest i never said he did what will you take for the thing well just look at the work in it they don't turn out the like of that nowadays dutch it is what they used for to put their milk and such like in damn it said horace completely losing his temper i know what it was used for will you tell me what you want for it i couldn't let a curiosity like that go for a penny under thirty shillings said mr dilger affectionately it would be robin myself i'll give you a sovereign for it there said horace you know best what profit that represents that's my last word my last word to that sir is good evenin said the worthy man good evening then said horace and walked out of the shop rather to bring mr dilger to terms than because he really meant to abandon the bottle for he dared not go back without it and he had nothing about him just then on which he could raise the extra ten shillings supposing the dealer refused to trust him for the balance and the time was growing dangerously short fortunately the well-worn ruse succeeded for mr dilger ran out after him and laid an unwashed claw upon his coat sleeve don't go mister he said i like to do business if i can though upon my word and honour a sovereign for a work o art like that well just for luck and be in my birthday we'll call it a deal horace handed over the coin which left him with a few pence there ought to be a lid or stopper of some sort he said suddenly what have you done with that no sir there you're mistook you are indeed i do assure you you never see a pot of this particular pattern with a lid to it never oh don't you though said horace i know better never mind he said as he recollected that the seal was in fakrash's possession i'll take it as it is don't trouble to wrap it up i'm in rather a hurry it was almost dark when he got back to his rooms where he found the genie shaking with mingled rage and apprehension no welcome to thee he cried dilatory dog that thou art hadst thou delayed another minute i would have called down some calamity upon thee well you need not trouble yourself to do that now returned ventimore here's your bottle and you can creep into it as soon as you please but the seal shrieked the genie what hast thou done with the seal which was upon the bottle why you've got it yourself of course said horace in one of your pockets o oh, thou of base antecedents howled fakrash shaking out his flowing draperies how should i have the seal it is but a fresh device of thine to outdo me don't talk rubbish retorted horace you made the professor give it up to you yesterday you must have lost it somewhere or other never mind i'll get a large cork or bung which will do just as well and i've lots of sealing wax i will have no seal but the seal of suleiman declared the genie for with no other will there be security verily i believe that that accursed sage thy friend hath contrived by some cunning to get the seal once more into his hands i will go at once to his abode and compel him to restore it i wouldn't 
said Horace, feeling extremely uneasy, for it was evidently a much simpler thing to let a genie out of a bottle than to get him in again. He's quite incapable of taking it, and if you go out now you'll only make a fuss and attract the attention of the press, which I thought you rather wanted to avoid. I shall attire myself in the garments of a mortal, even those I assumed on a former occasion, said Fakrash, and as he spoke his outer robes modernized into a frock coat. Thus shall I escape attention. Wait one moment, said Horace. What is that bulge in your breast pocket? Of a truth, said the genie, looking relieved but not a little foolish as he extracted the object, it is indeed the seal. You're in such a hurry to think the worst of everybody, you see, said Horace. Now do try to carry away with you into your seclusion a better opinion of human nature. Perdition to all the people of this age, cried Fakrash, reassuming his green robe and turban, for I now put no faith in human beings, and would afflict them all, were not the Lord Mayor, on whom be peace, mightier than I. Therefore, while it is yet time, take thou the stopper, and swear that, after I am in this bottle, thou wilt seal it as before, and cast it into deep waters, where no eye will look upon it more. With all the pleasure in the world, said Horace, only you must keep your part of the bargain first. You will kindly obliterate all recollection of yourself and the brass bottle from the minds of every human being who has had anything to do with you or it. Not so, objected the genie, for thus wouldst thou forget thy compact. Oh, very well, leave me out then, said Horace, not that anything could make me forget you. Fakrash swept his right hand round in a half circle. It is accomplished, he said. All recollection of myself and yonder bottle is now erased from the memories of every one but thyself. But how about my client? said Horace. I can't afford to lose him, you know. He shall return unto thee, said the genie, trembling with impatience. Now perform thy share. Horace had triumphed. It had been a long and desperate duel with this singular being, who was at once so crafty and so childlike, so credulous and so suspicious, so benevolent and so malign. Again and again he had despaired of victory, but he had won at last. In another minute or so this formidable genie would be safely bottled once more, and powerless to intermeddle and plague him for the future. And yet, in the very moment of triumph, quixotic as such scruples may seem to some, Ventimore's conscience smote him. He could not help a certain pity for the old creature, who was shaking there convulsively prepared to enter his bottle prison rather than incur a wholly imaginary doom. Fakrash had aged visibly within the last hour. Now he looked even older than his three thousand and odd years. True, he had led Horace a fearful life of late, but at first at least his intentions had been good. His gratitude, if mistaken in its form, was the sign of a generous disposition. Not every genie, surely, would have endeavoured to press untold millions and honours and dignities of all kinds upon him, in return for a service which most mortals would have considered amply repaid by a brace of birds and an invitation to an evening party. And how was Horace treating him? He was taking what, in his heart, he felt to be a rather mean advantage of the genie's ignorance of modern life to cajole him into returning to his captivity. Why not suffer him to live out the brief remainder of his years, for he could hardly last more than another century or two at most, in freedom. Fakrash had learnt his lesson. He was not likely to interfere again in human affairs. He might find his way back to the palace of the Mountain of the Clouds, and end his days there, in peaceful enjoyment of the society of such of the jinn as might still survive unbottled. So, obeying, against his own interests, some kindlier impulse, Horace made an effort to deter the genie, 
who was already hovering in air above the neck of the bottle in a swirl of revolving draperies, like some blundering old bee vainly endeavouring to hit the opening into his hive. "'Mr. Fakrash,' he cried, "'before you go any further, listen to me. There's no real necessity, after all, for you to go back to your bottle. If you'll only wait a little—' but the genie, who had now swelled to gigantic proportions, and whose form and features were only dimly recognizable through the wreaths of black vapour in which he was involved, answered him from his pillar of smoke in a terrible voice. "'Wouldst thou still persuade me to linger?' he cried. "'Hold thy peace, and be ready to fulfil thine undertaking.' "'But look here,' persisted Horace, I should feel such a brute if I sealed you up without telling you— The whirling and roaring column, in shape like an inverted cone, was being fast sucked down into the vessel, till only a semi-materialized but highly infuriated head was left above the neck of the bottle. "'Must I tarry,' it cried, "'till the Lord Mayor arrive with his memlooks and the hour of safety is expired?' by my head, if thou delayest another instant, I will put no more faith in thee, and I will come forth once more, and afflict thee and thy friends, I and all the dwellers in this accursed city, with the most painful and unheard-of calamities. And with these words the head sank into the bottle with a loud clap resembling thunder. Horace hesitated no longer, the genie himself had absolved him from all further scruples. To imperil Sylvia and her parents, not to mention all London, out of consideration for one obstinate and obnoxious old demon, would clearly be carrying sentiment much too far. Accordingly he made a rush for the jar and slipped the metal cover over the mouth of the neck, which was so hot that it blistered his fingers, and, seizing the poker, he hammered down the secret catch till the lid fitted as closely as Suleiman himself could have required. Then he stuffed the bottle into a kit-bag, adding a few coals to give it extra weight, and toiled off with it to the nearest steamboat pier, where he spent his remaining pence in purchasing a ticket to the temple. Next day the following paragraph appeared in one of the evening papers, which probably had more space than usual at its disposal. Singular Occurrence on a Penny Steamer A gentleman on board one of the Thames steamboats, so we are informed by an eye-witness, met with a somewhat ludicrous mishap yesterday evening. It appears he had with him a small portmanteau, or large handbag, which he was supporting on the rail of the stern bulwark. Just as the vessel was opposite the Savoy Hotel, he incautiously raised his hand to the brim of his hat, thereby releasing hold of the bag, which overbalanced itself and fell into the deepest part of the river, where it instantly sank. The owner, whose carelessness occasioned considerable amusement to passengers in his immediate vicinity, appeared no little disconcerted by the oversight, and was not unnaturally reticent as to the amount of his loss, though he was understood to state that the bag contained nothing of any great value. However this may be, he has probably learnt a lesson which will render him more careful in future. End of chapter 18 Epilogue of the Brass Bottle by F. Anstey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. The Epilogue. On a certain evening in May, Horace Ventimore dined in a private room at the Savoy as one of the guests of Mr. Samuel Wackerbath. In fact, he might almost be said to be the guest of the evening as the dinner was given by way of celebrating the completion of the host's new country house at Lipsfield, of which Horace was the architect, and also to congratulate him on his approaching marriage, which was fixed to take place early in the following month, with Miss Sylvia Futvoy. "'Quite a small and friendly party,' said Mr. Wackerbath, looking round on his numerous sons and daughters, as he greeted Horace in the reception-room. 
only ourselves you see miss futboy a young lady with whom you are fairly well acquainted and her people and an old schoolfellow of mine and his wife who are not yet arrived he's a man of considerable eminence he added with a roll of reflected importance in his voice quite worth your cultivating sir lawrence pountney his name is i don't know if you remember him but he discharged the onerous duties of lord mayor of london the year before last and acquitted himself very creditably in fact he got a baronetcy for it as the year before last was the year in which horace had paid his involuntary visit to the guildhall he was able to reply with truth that he did remember sir lawrence he was not altogether comfortable when the ex-lord mayor was announced for it would have been more than awkward if Sir Lawrence had chanced to remember him. Fortunately, he gave no sign that he did so, though his manner was graciousness itself. "'Delighted, my dear Mr. Ventimore,' he said, pressing Horace's hand almost as warmly as he had done that October day of the dais. "'Most delighted to make your acquaintance. I am always glad to meet a rising young man.' and I hear that the house you have designed for my old friend here is a perfect palace. A marvel, sir. I knew he was my man, declared Mr. Wackerbath, as Horace modestly disclaimed Sir Lawrence's compliment. You remember, Pountney, my dear fellow, that day when we were crossing Westminster Bridge together, and I was telling you I thought of building? Go to one of the leading men, an R.A. and all that sort of thing, you said, then you'll be sure of getting your money's worth. But I said, no, I like to choose for myself, to, uh, exercise my own judgment in these matters. And there's a young fellow I have in my eye who'll beat em all, if he's given the chance. I'm off to see him now. And off I went to Great Cloister Street, for he hadn't those palatial offices of his in Victoria Street at that time, without losing another instant, and dropped in on him with my little commission. Didn't I, Ventimore? You did indeed, said Horace, wondering how far these reminiscences would go. And, continued Mr. Wackerbath, patting Horace on the shoulder, from that day to this I've never had a moment's reason to regret it. We've worked in perfect sympathy. His ideas coincided with mine. I think he found that I met him, so to speak, on all fours. Ventimore assented, though it struck him that a happier expression might, and would, have been employed if his client had remembered one particular interview in which he had not figured to advantage. They went in to dinner, in a room sumptuously decorated with panels of grey-green brocade and softly shaded lamps, and screens of gilded leather, through the centre of the table rose a tall palm, its boughs hung with small electric globes like magic fruits. "'This palm,' said the professor, who was in high good humour, "'really gives quite an oriental look to the table. Personally, I think we might reproduce the Arabian style of decoration and arrangement generally in our homes with great advantage.' I often wonder it never occurred to my future son-in-law there to turn his talents in that direction and design an oriental interior for himself, nothing more comfortable and luxurious for a bachelor's purposes. I'm sure, said his wife, Horace managed to make himself quite comfortable enough as it was. He has the most delightful rooms in Vincent Square. Ventimore heard her remark to Sir Lawrence, I shall never forget the first time we dined there, just after my daughter and he were engaged. I was quite astonished. Everything was so perfect, quite simple, you know, but so ingeniously arranged, and his landlady such an excellent cook, too. Still, of course, in many ways, it will be nicer for him to have a home of his own. With such a beautiful and charming companion to share it with, said Sir Lawrence in his most florid manner, the, uh, poorest home would prove a paradise indeed. And I suppose now, my dear young lady, he added, raising his voice to address Sylvia, you are busy making your future abode as exquisite as taste and research can render it, ransacking all the furniture shops in London for treasures, and going about to auctions, 
or do you, uh, delegate that department to Mr. Ventimore? I do go about to old furniture shops, Mr. Lawrence, she said, but not auctions. I'm afraid I should only get just the thing I didn't want if I tried to bid. And, she added in a lower voice, turning to Horace, I don't believe you would be a bit more successful, Horace. What makes you say that, Sylvia? he asked with a start. "'Why, do you mean to say you've forgotten how you went to that auction for Papa and came away without having managed to get a single thing?' she said. "'What a short memory you must have!' There was only tender mockery in her eyes, absolutely no recollection of the sinister purchase he had made at that sale, or how nearly it had separated them for ever. So he hastened to admit that perhaps he had not been particularly successful at the auction in question. Sir Lawrence next addressed him across the table. I was just telling Mrs. Futboy, he said, how much I regretted that I had not the privilege of your acquaintance during my year of office. A Lord Mayor, as you doubtless know, has exceptional facilities for exercising hospitality and it would have afforded me real pleasure if your first visit to the Guildhall could have been paid under my, hm, ha, ah, auspices. "'You are very kind,' said Horace, very much on his guard. "'I could not wish to pay it under better.' "'I flatter myself,' said the ex-Lord Mayor, "'that, while in office, I did my humble best to maintain the traditions of the city,' and I was fortunate enough to have the honour of receiving more than the average number of celebrities as guests. But I had one great disappointment, I must tell you. It had always been a dream of mine that it might fall to my lot to present some distinguished fellow countryman with the freedom of the city. By some curious chance, when the opportunity seemed about to occur, the thing was put off, and I missed it. Missed it by the nearest hairbreadth. "'Ah, well, Sir Lawrence,' said Ventimore, "'one can't have everything.' "'For my part,' put in Lady Pountney, who had only caught a word or two of her husband's remarks, "'what I miss most is having the Sentinels present arms whenever I went out for a drive. They did it so nicely and respectfully. I confess I enjoyed that. My husband never cared much for it.' Indeed, he wouldn't even use the state coach unless he was absolutely obliged. He was as obstinate as a mule about it. I see, Lady Pountney, the professor put in, that you share the common prejudice against mules. It's quite a mistaken one. The mule has never been properly appreciated in this country. He is really the gentlest and most docile of creatures." "'I can't say I like them myself,' said Lady Pountney. "'Such a mongrel sort of animal, neither one thing nor the other.' "'And they're hideous too, Anthony,' added his wife, "'and not at all clever.' "'There you're mistaken, my dear,' said the professor. "'They are capable of almost human intelligence. "'I have had considerable personal experience of what a mule can do.' he informed Lady Pountney, who seemed still incredulous. More than most people, indeed, and I can assure you, my dear Lady Pountney, that they readily adapt themselves to almost any environment, and will endure the greatest hardships without exhibiting any signs of distress. I see by your expression, Ventimore, that you don't agree with me, eh? Horace had to set his teeth hard for a moment, lest he should disgrace himself by a peal of untimely mirth but by a strong effort of will he managed to command his muscles. "'Well, sir,' he said, "'I've only chanced to come into close contact with one mule in my life, and frankly I've no desire to repeat the experience.' "'You happen to come upon an unfavourable specimen, that's all,' said the professor. "'There are exceptions to every rule.' "'This animal,' Horace said, was certainly exceptional enough in every way. "'Do tell us about it,' pleaded one of the Miss Wackerbaths, and all the ladies joined in the entreaty, until Horace found himself under the necessity of improvising a story, which, it must be confessed, fell exceedingly flat. 
this final ordeal passed he grew silent and thoughtful as he sat there by sylvia's side looking out through the glazed gallery outside upon the spring foliage along the embankment the opaline river and the shot towers and buildings on the opposite bank glowing warm brown against an evening sky of silvery blue not for the first time did it seem strange incredible almost to him that all these people should be so utterly without any recollection of events which surely might have been expected to leave some trace upon the least retentive memory and yet it only proved once more how thoroughly and honourably the old genie now slumbering placidly in his bottle deep down in unfathomable mud opposite the very spot where they were dining had fulfilled his last undertaking fakrash the brass bottle and all the fantastic and embarrassing performances were indeed as totally forgotten as though they had never been and it is but too probable that even this modest and veracious account of them will prove to have been included in the general act of oblivion though the author will trust as long as possible that fakrash el amash may have neglected to provide for this particular case and that the history of the brass bottle may thus be permitted to linger a while in the memories of some at least of its readers end of epilogue end of the brass bottle by f anstey